Hi everyone, we need to talk about uh, the Labour leaks because this has caused a big furore this week. It's all over Twitter. Labour members are feeling cheated and betrayed because there is a leaked report that has made its way into the public eye which suggested that staff members of the Labour Party tried to sabotage the party's handling of anti-Semitism to undermine, or rather, and undermine Jeremy Corbyn, who was leader at the time. Now, the report is 860 pages long, and it won't be submitted to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission after Labour lawyers advised that it was stopped. To talk with me about this breaking news within the Labour Party, which just seems to get worse and worse, is a lot. Of, is somebody who knows a lot about the party's handling of anti-Semitism and undermining Jeremy Corbyn. That's Chris Williamson, former Labour MP for Derby North. How are you, mate? I'm all right. Thanks very much, you did. Enjoying the weather. <laughs> yeah, me too. Although it's typical, isn't it? We're told to stop indoors as soon as it, go, uh, get, it starts being sunny. What do you make of this report, Chris? Have you seen it? And I mean, we'll come on to Keir Starmer, Sir Keir. We'll come on to his, his reaction in a bit because that's a doozy. Um, but what do you make of this report and why would... Um, why would party members be trying to sabotage uh, any handling of anti-Semitism compl compliance? What do you make of it all, mate? Well, I think it's one of the most infamous chapters in the Labour Party's 120 years uh, history. Uh, it's truly shocking reading. I'm wading my way through it now. As you say, it's over 800 pages long. And uh, I've been dipping in and out of it as people have been contacting me who have been named in the document who are incredibly hurt and upset and distressed by some of the remarks which are contained therein. And obviously what it does reveal is that we had a cancer right at the heart of the Labour Party. Many of us suspected it, knew it, but to see it actually confirmed in black and white is still very, very shocking indeed to see people and using the sort of language that they were using as well is, uh, is incredibly uh, troubling in my view. And, you know, to have a situation where in the run into the 27 general, uh, 2017 general election, you've got people at the very top of the Labour Party who were charged with helping to secure a Labour victory, actually working for a Labour defeat. Uh, people even talking about whether or not they were unsure as to whether they could vote uh, Labour or possibly vote Conservative. Instead, it's uh, an terribly, a terribly shabby, shabby affair. and. Uh, it really does bring into sharp uh, relief, really, the the whole um, problem that the Labour Party has been encountering for the last four years. And I know some people are talking about it's important to remain in the party. I'm not sure that, frankly, the Labour Party now is capable of, of, of being rescued. Oh, it's, uh, 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 it does make me laugh. People saying, stop and fight. We can win. <laughs> it does. You, you're saying the language there. I just want to uh, show people... Uh, whether the sort of language that was was, was used in this um, in this in this report. So this is uh, something. Uh, this is an article I'm showing on the screen at the moment. You can't see it, Chris, by somebody called Sienna Rogers. And uh, I just want to highlight. There's a bit here, down here I highlighted. The report report claims to reveal comments from staff members, including dis describing Corbynites as nutters. Describing of hanging and burning Jeremy Corbyn, create a calling Lotto, which is sort of like their headquarters, the Labour headquarters, uh, calling uh, Seamus Milne a total mentalist and nutter, referring to Lotto's Carrie Murphy as Medusa, crazy, a bitch faced cow, crazy snake lady, and saying her face would make a good dartboard. The report includes messages allegedly showing how staffers talked about pro-Corbyn young Labour member with mental health problems. So this is a young Labour member, Chris, that they're talking about with mental health problems. And they're saying that they're hoping that the member dies in a fire, saying I wouldn't piss on him to put it out and adding wish there was a petrol can emoji. This is disgusting and my my question to you so one of the things that i cannot stand about politics and i know a lot of people a lot of working class people ordinary people feel the same way and that they're never consistent are they these politicians chris i know you were that's to your detriment that's one of the reasons why i think they kicked you out but if this was a tory whatsapp group 
How do you think Sir Keir, or as I call him, Mr. Irrelevant now, how do you think that they would be reacting to this? Wouldn't they be calling for these people to be expelled from the Conservative Party? And this is within their own party and they're doing nothing. No, I think they most certainly would do. I mean, look, these, these, these remarks are, are loathsome, of hateful, truly offensive and, and detestable. And for them to be uttered by senior Labour Party figures, I mean, you're absolutely right. We would be truly appalled and shocked and, and calling for uh, swift action uh, from the Conservative Party were it to have been language used in a Conservative Party WhatsApp group. Uh, but here we have people who are supposedly Labour Party members, employees, bureaucrats in the party, as I've already said, charged with helping to uh, secure a Labour victory to try and transform the country. And, you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of, of members of the Labour Party in that 2017 election in particular who were, you know, slugging the guts out day in and day out to be undermined and sabotaged in this way. It's, it's truly unforgivable, in my opinion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they should be sacked. I mean, they if not, I mean, many of them have gone already, I know. But, uh, you know, we're looking at what further action that we might be able to take. I know that some of those people uh, responsible for these uh, spurious uh, accusations and smears are trying to cover their tracks and, and threatening legal action against people for having the temerity to share the report. Uh, saying that they uh, could be in breach of data protection law and yeah, that they I'm, I'm going to come in libel actions, etc. I've got to and come on to that. It's designed to scare people into into suppressing what is a truly uh, devastating expose of the type of people that we're dealing with here. And these are people. Some of them, as I said, um, you know, are, are right at the heart, or have been right at the heart yeah. of the Labour Party. I mean, it brings the whole institution of the Labour Party into utter disrepute. I mean, unless Sir Keir Starmer acts, I was going to say swiftly, but he's hardly been swift about it, but unless he acts fairly soon to take decisive action here, well, it calls into question uh, his motivations, it seems to me, as well. And, uh, you know, frankly, the Labour Party isn't worth saving if the, uh, you know, these people aren't dealt with and action isn't taken. Uh, and that a new uh, chapter is begun. I mean, we absolutely need to, need to turn a page on this. But in order to do that, we have to take action and put in place procedures that actually can ensure this can never, ever happen again. Yeah, they, they, you say that they, they, they should be sacked, but they, they haven't sacked them. In fact, they haven't suspended them. They haven't done anything so far, at, at least at the time of us recording. In fact, one of them, I believe, since, has those, uh, those, since sending those letters has become a lord. Um, but uh, which is, uh, is McNichol. But th th I want to get on to to something else. Um, that I, another article that I this here is from the, the Evening Standard. Now, can you hear this, Chris? Can you hear this? Well, that kind of thing is is clearly no. Is it... no okay. I'll I'll have to probably tell you what what's going on here. But this is um, this is the uh, Shadow Chancellor Annalise Dodds, who I believe has just been made Shadow Chancellor in Keir Starmer's. Um, cabinet, or, or rather shadow cabinet. So this is the Evening Standard. They're tweeting out um, a, a interview that she did with Sky News. Let me just show you what the action they're taking right now. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, let me just play it for the audience. Well, that kind of thing is, is clearly deeply, deeply unpleasant. And that's why we need to have an independent review to understand what happened so she says, what she says there, Chris, is, is that uh, we need to have an independent review to find out what happened. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a report, is it not, that comes from a review or an inv investigation. So what they're actually, uh, what she's actually asking for, therefore, is an investigation into an investigation that led to the report. Is that correct? Yes, and I think that's what uh, Sir Keir Starmer's uh, called for as well. I mean, People have compared it to a Monty Python sketch, you know, calling for an investigation into an investigation. I mean, this is just absurd. Oh, uh, it, know, doesn't what, there, really? it doesn't well, stop there, mate. It doesn't stop there. Let me let me play oh. the rest of this for the audience. Okay. It doesn't stop there because what she goes on to say then is it's it, it's so funny. This is it's the, she goes on to gaslight people from there on. Listen. 
and to deal with it and above all to make sure that it never ever happens again so she says above all make sure that it never happens that happens again so do the investigation into the investigation that led to the report and then she says this you know, the Labour Party has got 580,000 members. No, they haven't. The Labour Party has not got 580,000 members. That's what she says. The Labour Party have got 580,000 members. 300,000 of them didn't vote in that leadership election. Now, what that suggests to me, Chris, I don't know about you, is that over half of the Labour Party have bloody left after the uh, what they've what what has happened in the last few months and obviously we'll go into into what the happened to you last year but um 300k didn't vote in that election 500 300k didn't vote in that election so definitely haven't got 580,000 members now so she's they've called it an investigation into the investigation that led to the report that she went on to gaslight people there and say that they've got twice as many members as they've actually got. Certainly not paid up members, that's for sure. And then, as you brought, you pointed out in this in this tweet earlier, Chris, the response to the character assassination, smears, and sabotage exposed in the Labour leaks document is to shoot the messenger, Sir Starmer, as I call him, Mister Irrelevant, wants an inquiry into how it was leaked. And now these characters are threatening legal action against those exposing the, the abuse. They don't actually want to look into this report or get to the bottom of it. They just want to discredit it, don't they, mate? Well, it looks that way, certainly. And, you know, look, if I was a leader of the Labour Party and I was presented with a report like this, then, you know, I would obviously be looking to take action as soon as I possibly could to uh, deal with the, uh, the people who are responsible. And uh, I mean, as Annalise Dodd said there, it's really important that new procedures are put in place, but you know, unless we can actually, or unless the party can you know, rebuild that trust, then uh, frankly, I think we will see a hemorrhaging of uh, Labour Party members uh, from the party. And I know that, uh, as I've said previously, you know, people are, some people are saying, look, let's stay in the party and fight. You know, we can, we can uh, recover uh, the situation. I'm not sure. It's possible. I mean, I gave 44 years of my life, dedicated yeah. 44 years of my life to the Labour Party. And uh, I was a you know, very strong tribal Labour Party supporter. I always felt Labour was the best vehicle to deliver some progressive change in the country. But in terms of you know, getting a grip of the party, it's impossible. The fact is that it's owned by the people who are, you know, the sort of people who are behind the, 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 these disgraceful revelations that, that we're talking about in this report. The National Executive Committee is an undemocratic institution. Only 25% of the members of the National Executive Committee are elected by the members. The rest are appointed by you know, trade union bureaucrats or the leader of the party, the parliamentary party. Um, So-called socialist societies uh, send one representative. Um, you've got the leaders of the party in Wales and Scotland send representatives. These people are not elected. So 25% of the NEC's um, elected, that's all. Uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party is is, is completely uh, out, out of control. They're, they're not subject to any democratic accountability whatsoever. Our efforts, my efforts, when I was uh, going around the country as part of what we call the Democracy Roadshow, yeah. where we talked about democratising the party, where we talked about introducing open selection, that was rejected. It was voted down, actually, even though 90% of the constituency delegates at the Labour Party conference in 2018, over 90% of the delegates there from the constituency Labour parties voted in favour of open selection. It was lost, though, by the narrowest of margins because the only trade union delegation to vote uh, with the CLP delegates was the Fire Brigade Union. The rest voted it down. Um, again, I think in the teeth of opposition really from their members and I know for a fact that Unite for example led by Len McCluskey uh, at that uh, conference voted against when that was against their own union policy. Len McCluskey's own union voted in 2016 to support open selections and yet in 2018 when there was an opportunity to actually introduce open selections he led the delegation to vote against it uh, and then um, we had a shouting match with me. He was doing the shouting rather than me uh, at conference in the exhibition area, um, attacking me for having the temerity to to call them out. I'd written an article for whilst conference was still running for the Morning Star, 
where I pointed out that democracy wouldn't be crushed by a bureaucratic machine. And he obviously took great exception to that. But the truth is, as I pointed out to Lynn very calmly, uh, or as calmly as I could, as pinned up against the wall with a, in, sort of shouting in my face, that the Unite policy was very clear and he voted against Unite policy. And I just kept repeating that to, to him, you know. But uh, hey, it was having none of it. It was, uh, it was an unedifying um, um, spectacle, I've got to say. But that's what we're up against. You know, we've got yeah. people who are in very privileged positions and they um, think they're a law unto themselves. And, and frankly, I just therefore think that to stay and fight and good luck to people who want to try and do that and try and fight for something. I mean, you know, there may be some gains that we can get at the local level. But in terms of really gaining control of the party, we didn't even control the party when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader and we had getting on for 600,000 members. and Plus, I mean, you know, getting on for three quarters of a million when you take into account affiliated uh, members and uh, registered support. Mm-hmm. Um, we still didn't control the party even then. It was still in the hands of the uh, of the right wing of the party. They, they, they own the party. So the NEC, the Parliamentary Labour Party, and the bureaucracy, as we've seen from these revelations, are totally at odds to where the vast majority of the members are at. So I just don't feel the Labour Party is a suitable vehicle anymore to deliver the kind of change that the vast majority of members want to see in this country. And that's why I think we need to try and build something new. I'm trying to establish a, a new grassroots movement, which has been hampered somewhat by the COVID-19 crisis. And, uh, but we're still doing the best we can uh, online to try and move that forward. But we are planning to uh, have a launch. We were looking to launch it formally in June. At what we've called a festival of resistance, but obviously that's been postponed. Yeah, you're going to have to delay that, mate. <laughs> till October, yeah, well, indeed. Well, we're postponing it to October, and we'll see whether the social distancing uh, has been relaxed. It's all right, mate. Relaxed. Silver linings, <laughs> silver linings, with it being delayed, there's a, there's a better chance that uh, Julian Assange will be able to speak at it when well, you Well, we've when invited you Julian. Uh, I've I know you did. Julian and invited him, and uh, uh, his father has agreed to, to come anyway and, uh, and address the, uh, the gathering there. But uh, yeah, so we're hopeful that we can build something and uh, and try and uh, you know create a scenario where we are uh, building a grassroots, a genuine grassroots movement that can start actually doing things for itself, rather than wasting a lot of energy inside a uh, you know bureaucratic, bureaucratic structure of the Labour Party for very little return. That would be my my concern. I think people could put their energies into you know building capacity in community, building political consciousness, helping to create worker cooperative community action groups and this type of thing and and really you know put pressure through like street protests and we've got people from the gilets jeans planning to come and speak uh you know people involved in that movement in france against uh, macron's neoliberal uh, reforms uh, to come and speak to us uh, about their experience so that's what we're, we're, we're hoping to try and do and uh, and obviously some of those people will be you know labor party supporters and, and members still and, and as i've said good luck to them and i think there's pressure that can be applied inside the Labour Party. But I just think if that's where people expend all of their energy, that, you know, the danger is they become incredibly frustrated and potentially disillusioned. Whereas I think if we put our energies into something, you know, practical that, that, that really has the potential to make a real difference, uh, then I think, you know, there'd be, there'd be more rewards from that and uh, more fulfilling. And I think, that, you know, we might be able to, you know, make, make greater progress that way. And you know maybe push the Labour Party in a in a in a different direction, or potentially um, assist in the formation of another political entity that that might have a chance of um, uh, you know contesting elections uh, competitively and and replace the Labour Party. And a lot of people say that's impossible. Well, but, please. You know the Labour Party <laughs> was created uh, 120 years ago, and uh, at that time uh, there was a duopoly between the. Liberals and the Tories, and, and Labour came on the scene in the Labour Representation Committee, born out of the trade union movement. Uh, and uh, so it's not to say that it has a God given right to remain as a, a major political party, a major political force. And frankly, I think that it's going down the road of a, a sort of pacification um, uh, agenda is, is, is about to befall the, uh, the Labour Party. You know, what happened to PASOK, the, uh, the Greek uh, Socialist Party, which is now basically an utter irrelevance. Mm. Uh, and we're seeing that with a lot of those sort of left to centre political parties across the continent. And it was only really, I think, the um, arrival of Jeremy Corbyn that, that, that sort of saved the Labour Party from going in a similar direction. Yeah. And now we've got Sir Starmer at the helm. I, I don't think there's much to um, 
to, to, to prevent the pasokification of the party um, actually happening here too. Yeah, to Sistama, Sakir, Sakir, as I, like I, as I say, mystery of relevance. I just want to bring people's attention to this. Uh, here is what he said. This is from iNews I'm showing. Leaked Labour report. Keir Starmer moves to reassure party members after launching, quote, urgent investigation into anti-Semitism leaks. Just read a little bit about this. It says Sir Keir Starmer will read a message to all Labour members to acknowledge their growing concerns surrounding a leaked report that revealed attempts to undermine Jeremy Corbyn by party officials. The new Labour leader launched an urgent independent investigation on Monday to look into the report which suggested Labour staff members tried to sabotage the party's handling of anti-Semitism. Well, it didn't really suggest that. It showed it by the look of it, by the look from what I've seen. This is what you said on Twitter, though, Chris, because obviously I want to uh, I want to talk about um, the, the way you were treated. Um, and a little bit lower on this tweet that you sent out, you said this. You said, with all the breathless hyperbole, I was expecting some spectacular revelations, but the six pages about me and UK Labour's leaked report were an anticlimax. I demolished all those weak allegations last year, and the party has again misrepresented their defeat in the High Court. Now, I want to concentrate on this, Chris, because they didn't half misrepresent your defeat in the High Court, which wasn't a defeat. Remind me, who paid your legal fees in that, Chris? The Labour Party were required to pay 100% of my legal costs. Well, so when, when, when does that ever happen when you've been defeated? Can you think? <laughs> well, it never happens. It never happens, does it? So I, I want to come back to this because I want to show that there's a, there's a, 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 I'm sure you're aware of them, the campaign for Chris Williamson. Um, you, you attached this, this video. And I want to show this video, if you don't mind. It's two minutes and 19 seconds long. I hope I know you won't be able to hear it, uh, Chris, but I want to play it because I have, I'll give, show you some examples, actually, in a little bit of um, the way that this has been portrayed in the media. Because this, remember, has been portrayed over and over as an anti-Semitism row or row over anti-Semitism. And it's not that at all, really, if you actually listen to your words. I'm going to play this. This is basically what you said at that Momentum meeting. Where was it? Sheffield, was it? Sheffield, yeah. I want to, I want to play it just so that people know exactly what was said and in what context. I'm going to play all of this. We've backed off far too much. We've given too much ground. We've been too apologetic. <laughs> So, Chris Williamson never said that Labour had been too apologetic about anti-Semitism. Never. 
Chris. In the, uh, that's the whole segment I've just showed. That's the whole two minute, 20 second segment that's shown in context. You never actually said that, did you? Quite the contrary, actually. I mean, it was 180 degrees uh, opposite to what I actually said. But never let the facts get in the way of a good smear. Seems well, you say that. Never let the facts get into the way of a good smear. Let me just show you this. This is from the BBC that I'm showing on screen now. MP Chris Williamson sues Labour for suspension over anti-Semitism. That's on the 14th of August. And it says here the line. I've highlighted it in the BBC. Chris Williamson had claimed the party was, quote, too apologetic on anti-Semitism. That's not the case whatsoever. Here's the BBC again. 10th of October, MP Chris Williamson loses anti-Semitism suspension appeal. Not right. It's not right, is it? You won. They, they paid your legal fees, so obviously you won that case. And again, I've highlighted it. Chris Williamson was suspended in February after claiming Labour had been too apologetic in its response to criticism of handling accusations. Now, that's, you can see how they've changed the rhetoric a couple of months later, but here's the Guardian, GCHQ's mouthpiece. Chris, Chris Williamson loses his legal bid over Labour Party suspension. This was from the 10th of October last year. Court says party quote acted quote in good faith in case of MP suspended in row over anti-Semitism. Again, that's totally incorrect. Here's another one. Politics home. Chris Williamson loses court bid to be reinstated as Labour MP. No, you didn't. You won that court bid. You won that. They paid your <laughs> they paid your fees. Here's Sky News. General election. Labour blocks anti-Semitism row MP Chris Williamson from standing. Do you see how they're changing the wording on this? That Labour blocks anti-Semitism row MP Chris Williamson from standing. Again, you weren't talking about anti-Semitism. Here's one from The Telegraph. John McDonnell under fire over Labour Group's support for anti-Semitic row MP Chris Williamson. Here's another one from The Guardian. MP suspended for suggesting party was, quote, too apologetic about anti-Semitism and readmitted. Again, not true. Again, the exact opposite, essentially, of what they're implying there. Here's from the Metro. Chris Williamson allowed back into Labour after suspension over anti-Semitism route. Again, associating you with anti-Semitism. And here's the last one. This is from the JC. This is one of the most disgusting ones, and obviously there were lots of these. Outrageous Labour lifts suspension of quote, Jubater MP Chris Williamson. Chris, what's it like to be faced with, let's face it, complete and utter bollocks being written about you for over a year? Well, it's not a pleasant place to be. It's, it's quite despicable, really. And uh, I'm in good company, though, of course. There's plenty of other people who have been subjected to similar and indeed worse treatment in this country and obviously abroad, where being a socialist who can get you uh, locked up, uh, beaten, uh, or even assassinated. So, you know, I haven't experienced anything like that. And uh, no, it's not pleasant. And I think the last time I was on your uh, program, uh, Gordon, I had a touch on this, but the thing that really got me through was the amazing solidarity from yeah. supporters up and down the country, members of the party rallied to my support. I, interestingly, the characters who have been exposed in this leaked document, um, even after the COVID-19 lockdown started, were continuing the purge of socialists of the Labour Party. And three members, and there are probably many others as well who haven't been in touch with me, but three members after the lockdown had started said they'd received letters from the Labour Party suspending them from the party. And amongst the grounds given for their suspension was their support for me for sharing um, support online for me. That's grounds for suspension? That's grounds for the suspension. I mean, and don't forget the grounds that they used to suspend me, or many of the grounds, many of the excuses that were put forward, was my support for other members who'd been falsely accused. And most of those members that I was supporting, uh, who'd been falsely accused of anti-Semitism, were Jewish members, anti-Zionist, you know, Jewish members of the party. I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I, one of the one of the one of the things that the high, that was highlighted in that report, I believe, was uh, it, it was highlighting the coordination of attacks with journalists, and I've noticed here that all along 
all along with the criticism, not just of you, but especially of Jeremy Corbyn as well, especially with this anti-Semitic stick that they kept beating him, beating him with. All along, the people who were making the allegations, for the most part, weren't Jewish. And also, they were also the people who were loudest in the condemnation of Jeremy Corbyn on every other issue, from his stance on whatever to his clothing. You know, these are people that obviously just hated Jeremy Corbyn and what he stood for. And the media should have seen that, and but they didn't. They played into it and they placated it, didn't they? Um, what does it say about that? They have, I mean, this is obviously, this is the weaponizing of anti-Semitism, isn't it? Oh, it most certainly is. And of course, they hate the fact that I refuse to concede to them, to yield to them whenever I was interviewed about the issue. I continue to show my solidarity with people falsely accused and, and, and to support them and to also continue to make the point that the Labour Party has always been an anti-racist party and has done more than any other political party to fight the scourge of bigotry, racism and anti-Semitism. And, and we should be proud of our record. Uh, but what it does reveal, I think, is that, is that the media is utterly corrupt and broken in this country. And of course, one of the other reasons why Jeremy Corbyn was targeted, not just simply because of his stance in relation to Palestine or indeed his support for a modest uh, socialist program, it was also because of his uh, obvious determination in, in a speech which he, he set out his determination at the Edinburgh Festival in, uh, I think it was August 2018, yeah, where he talked about democratising the media, making them accountable, not just implementing Leveson 1 and embarking on Leveson 2, but actually subjecting uh, the, the, the governors of the BBC, for example, to a democratic election of its employees uh, to top slice the big media giants in this country and to start funding local uh, journalist cooperatives, collectives, you know, to do genuine um, investigative uh, journalism to really hold, you know, local, I need the national for that matter, but certainly the local public institutions to account. I mean, look, the media at the end of the day the main thing that it's always been concerned about is generating profit. And the way they generate profit is, is the circulation. So the more lurid that they can actually be with their absurd headlines that they put out, yeah. you know, the more, particularly now in this modern age, the more clicks they get it on the, on the online platforms that they've now got. But of course, the other thing is, it's circulation, it's selling advertising, and the more circulation, obviously, the easier it is to sell advertising. But of course, the main thing that they're concerned about, bearing in mind that they're owned by uh, four or five uh, textile billionaires, is to maintain the status quo in this country, to maintain their privileged yeah. position. They can't countenance even a, a modest move uh, away from that, where and what we were talking about in, in Labour's programme was a relatively modest socialist programme, you know, a bit more uh, redistribution and so on, an uh, attack on poverty. I mean, you know, for God's sake, in the fifth biggest economy in the world, nobody should be living in poverty at all. Um, but that, even that wasn't, wasn't deemed to be acceptable. And obviously they use their, uh, their mouthpieces in the mainstream media to constantly perpetuate this, this right-wing analysis. And uh, obviously it does have an effect at the end of the day. And, you know, the, the bigotry that they perpetuate, the, the, uh, the, the sort of the cynicism that they, that they generate, the way in which they try and make the point that you know, look, politics is pointless. You can't change anything. Just give up. No wonder the vast bulk of people, the biggest cohort in every election, are those who don't vote. Out. And that's what they want. I mean, and and frankly, yeah. you know, with with the way the Labour Party is going now, and the way it was going prior to that, little wonder that people were were opting out of actually, you know, voting because you've got the Tories on the one hand, and then you've got the Tory Party Mark II on the other. Yes, slightly better. I was a member of it at the time. There was some obvious gains that were, that were made, but it should and could in, have done so much more than it did. And a lot of people just felt that, you know, democracy had failed them. Uh, it hadn't, you know, addressed the, the main problem that they were having to experience on a daily basis, particularly in the, you know, places like the coalfield communities, the old steel towns and textile towns, etc. in the, put on in the north of the country. They've just been abandoned, um, cynically abandoned. And uh, I think Jeremy... And the, and the agenda that, that he was promoting offered a bit of hope to people, uh, and they wanted yeah. to they wanted to destroy that hope, and uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, that, that they well they they've certainly succeeded in 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 
damaging the Labour Party and in, in, in smashing the Corbyn project. And, and I just wish Jeremy had been stronger in standing up to them. If he'd done that, if yeah, he'd fought, me too. he would have, uh, I'm sure he would have prevailed because uh, the overwhelming majority of the grassroots members, who the party should in theory belong to, but it doesn't, yeah. uh, would have got behind him. And I think we could have won. And we could have been transforming this country now for the better. Instead, we, you know, we, we've got Bojo at the helm, um, you know, a turbocharged neoliberal, uh, you know, committed to the kind of status quo that has left so many people struggling to you know, make ends meet. You mentioned the uh, media there. The, you know, the the one the one highlight really with this pandemic is that the media is looks like they're dead. <laughs> it looks like they're, they're, they're certainly there any media that is that is relied on the advertising model. They're all on Twitter at the moment, begging hashtag buy a paper. So you know, silver linings and all that. Do you, you I, I showed you know a lot of the headlines there, Mushra presenting um, what what went on last year with you, uh, Chris. How many people are you going to be suing going forward? Because I really would, if I was you, I'd be suing a lot of people, at least trying to. Well, there's a lot of people I'd love to be issuing writs against, I can tell you that. Um, a few very high, high profile people. Um, yeah, I can imagine. It's, 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 you know, it's a financial risk and uh, my own legal uh, case against the Labour Party alone costs nearly £100,000, uh, just under £90,000, you know, so... These, it's not cheap, you know, taking legal action is not, not cheap. And this is why. Wait a minute, the, that Labour yeah. had to pay? Yes. So, oh, that's so, so no wonder. You must have felt awful then. So, because the people who then had to pay for your representation, for suing the Labour Party for what they did to you or, go, uh, or, or taking them to court, were the Labour Party members. Yeah. Because that's I mean, where their funds come from. Oh, that must have been, that must have really hurt. Well, I mean, obviously, it wasn't my intention ever to, I could never, if you'd have said to me 10 years ago, I'd be taking the Labour Party to the High Court. You'd think it was said, preposterous. That, that'd be ridiculous. Of course, I'd never do that. I was a very loyal Labour Party. In fact, you'd struggle to find a more loyal party member than I was, I've got to say. But if they can do that to somebody like me, you know, nobody's safe. And uh, it was only because, you know, being an MP and, and I've been in the news a little bit and so I had a, a bit of a profile, we were able to raise the finance through crowdfunding. I mean, I'm, you know, from, from modest means, I've got... Yeah, obviously, you weren't benefit. the only person in the Labour Party who were, who was, a, 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 you know, felt the victimisation of this. There are many others, I'm thinking, you know, just, just higher profile ones that maybe wouldn't have been able to get the funds. People like Jackie Walker, people like Asa Winstanley, who have obviously been treated terrible, and that's just a goal. My mate Pete Gregson is the same. He, did, you know, he, he's a, a real supporter of, 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 of democracy. And that's the thing that it comes down to, isn't it, mate? I mean, for First of all, I want to I want to leave you with a couple of a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk about you know the other people um, who were affected by this. How you know you're launching this uh, this left legal fund, aren't you? How is that going to help these people going forward? And how can they maybe get in contact with you and and try and formulate some strategy of actually no, fighting yeah, back? Yeah. Well, certainly yes. I mean, what we did is to is to use the the costs that are awarded against the party um, to uh, establish a left legal fighting fund. Uh, that's why we set up our own crowdfunding platform, because uh, always the intention was that if we were successful, if I was successful, uh, that we would then use any cost to, to try and help others. So, but though, I mean, the Labour Party essentially has not just paid my cost, but it's also been paying the cost of other people who we've been representing okay. since that. I mean, and there's, there's a number of people that we've already been supporting. Um, um, interestingly, um, you know, Jewish and uh, there's a Palestinian lad who was uh, has been accused uh, as well. And, um, you know, he was someone who's experienced, you know, the horrors of living in Gaza, who's had relatives murdered by the Israeli Defence Force, who was himself shot by an Israeli sniper. Uh, and he has been uh, accused now of, of, of being a racist. Uh, it's just a horrendous, horrendous. And, and looking through the allegations put to him, I mean, just the impertinence of the questions of somebody with his background, his experiences to have to respond to this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's beyond disgusting. It truly is reprehensible that the Labour Party is doing this. I also know uh, a number of people who have been subjected to these appalling smears and allegations and then suspensions have, have experienced real severe mental ill health uh, as a consequence of that. You know, it's really, it's really affected people. It's their whole identity. 
they've given their life to this movement. They've given their life to fighting racism. And then now suddenly they're being accused of being a racist. Somebody I was just speaking to just this morning, one of the earlier cases who joined the Labour Party, inspired by the agenda that Jeremy Corbyn was articulating. Um, and he was accused of the most appalling um, things, to be in a Holocaust denial and so on. It's complete fabrication, a complete fabrication. However, his case uh, ended up in the national media. Indeed, it was reported internationally. Uh, he he uh, you know, experienced incredible trauma uh, from that exposure, but also he was then subjected to intimidation. He had his property vandalized, his car smashed up, you know. This is at the hands of the Labour Party. This is what disgusts me so much. This, 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 this is the party that historically has been standing up for these people. Exactly. You know? It's outrageous. And now in letters that the Labour Party is sending out to people, uh, it's, uh, it, it has a disclaimer in there saying that, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're feeling under pressure, you can contact the Samaritans or your doctor. Uh, I mean, they're acknowledging that people, you know, maybe as a result of this, on the verge of um, committing suicide. And I mean, indeed, there's at least one person where, you know, it's debatable that she sadly, you know, took her own life as a consequence oh. of this appalling, despicable. I mean, look, the, I can't find words really to describe that, the horrors, the, how, how disgraceful it is that my party, that I gave yeah. all my life to, could treat people like this. Done in the name of the Labour Party, it's all, you know, it's kind of just, Unbelievable, and we, well, we have a situation is a is a kind of George Orwell meets uh, Franz Kafka, and meets uh, Joe McCarthy. The way in which the Labour Party is being yeah. behaving, because and this this uh, man I was speaking to today, we're going to look to see how we can help him. He's named in the report. Um, you know, he he was himself making this point that he was unable. As I wasn't, and indeed anybody else uh, who is subject to the disciplinary um, action against the party, you're unable under the party's rules to speak about it. So he was, as I was, and indeed others, you know, um, accused of all these things, and all these headlines were appearing in the paper about him, and um, he wasn't on totally it. Totally gagged from reply. He, he, he indeed. I mean, because, you know, he thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll fly by the rules. And this is a guy. A grassroots member, he wasn't a member of parliament or anything like myself. I mean, people might say, well, it's fair game, you're a member of parliament in that sense, but this is a guy just only a our member. And, you know, they make, well, they don't discriminate in that sense, they just, they, they, they treat everybody the same. They want to literally crush people, not just a political yeah. uh, action they want to take, they want to crush people entirely. This is what they were doing to, to Jeremy. I saw it at close quarters in the Parliamentary Labour Party. They were trying to break him as a man. It was an appalling, I mean, they used to you know, do the same to me. It was disgusting at, at parliamentary Labour Party meetings. Uh, the way they behaved was everything they accuse us of doing: bullying, shouting people down. I mean, screaming at me. It was, it was just unbelievable. And all the media waiting outside, they could hear virtually every word. It used to be, sometimes it was, they would um, they were running commentary on it. In fact, the last meeting before I was suspended, two days before I was suspended, I was howled down. For um, example, saying, look, surely we can, we all join the Labour Party to fight for you know, social justice, for, for an ethical foreign policy. We may have different ideas about how we kind of arrive at the destination, but surely we all want to arrive at that same destination. Don't we? So can't we find it within ourselves to you know, work together? As Joe Cox said, there's more that unites us than, than, than divides us. I was literally howled down for having the temerity to say so I think this was always being all of this was being noted and reported because they could hear it through through the doors in the corridor there and outside committee room 14 in the house of the parliament uh and was being put online this i mean these these people are just <laughs> well they I can be, see be I can... Of the labor party let alone being actually uh representing the labor party in the house of parliament it's a disgrace it brings politics into and democracy into absolute disrepute that's um, that's the point. It's uh, you know I can't imagine what it's what it's been like for you having to having put forty four years of sweat and toil and whatever. I know how much effort. The, I've I've looked, took a, an in depth look at your career. There's a lot there that you've done for that party and a hell of a lot of blood and sweat and and hours that have gone into that party. And I can't imagine what it's like now to see 
what what it's become because me I've never been a member of the Labour Party. I've only really been paying attention to politics over the last four years. And what I can see, what I can clearly see, is over the last decade the Labour Party have shifted to become the UK's DNC. You know, and they have actively, actively over the last eighteen months, certainly you, you could probably take it back to since Jeremy Corbyn was made um, was made leader. They've actively subverted democracy. They have subverted the democratic will of the members of their own party who give them money. And if you're crowing about democracy, but you're, you don't even want democracy within your own party, and, you know, you, you, you maybe have to put a health warning on your flyers to actually join it because it's... The, there's no hope. You're Mr. Irrelevant if you're Sustir Car or you Sustir Sakir Starmer, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the Labour Party is in, in, in a bad place. I think um, I think the uh, analysis that you've just outlined there about it, it being an anti-democratic institution frustrated box. I think it probably goes back further than that. It's just been brought into sharper focus, I suppose, because for the first time, probably in the Labour Party's history really maybe since Keir Hardy they've had a we've had a socialist as a leader of the party and uh, you know the potential um to to really you know make a difference I guess you know you could say Michael Michael Fort as another example of, of someone who was absolutely introduced and demonized in a similar sort of the way to the way in which Jeremy Corbyn was but I think it's in far worse and I think the reason that they were I suppose even more virulent against the Jeremy was that there was a, a real prospect, I think, of him, of him getting into uh, office, and uh, probably yeah. less so under, under under Michael. Although in the early days of Michael Foot's uh, tenure, of course, I mean Labour did, you know, was riding quite high. But then the SDP was founded by uh, uh, Roy Jenkins, uh, David Owen, uh, Shirley, David Owen, yeah, Rogers, and Bill Rogers, you know, the so-called Gang of Four. I mean, and their their whole raison d'être really was to stop us from coming to. The power and they, they succeeded they managed to put the, the anti-Tory vote get the Labour vote and uh, Thatcher got in with a landslide in 83 with a smaller share of the vote than the Tories achieved in 1979 so we've always had you know huge forces ranged against us um, but as we saw in 2017 you know we got the biggest increase in vote shares since 1945 and you know with the advent of social media when when you know before momentum went 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 bad <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've got a really good uh, yeah, grassroots organisation that kind of coordinated and organised. Um, and thank goodness they did, because it was really down to momentum, I think, uh, that Labour did as well as it did. Because as we know from this report, the the party uh, hierarchy, the bureaucrats at, at the head of the party, at the centre of the party, the shipping coordinator of the campaign, were, were coordinating in an attempt to try and lose the uh, uh, election. Yeah. And that's why I think they were so shocked. And I, you know, I've got to say, oh my victory in Derby North in 2017 to the you know efforts of momentum activists down the country but they were badly let down by their leadership as well like it's got to be said and uh, you know momentum was well it turned into a, a you know part of the problem really and yeah. they kind of joined in the witch hunt and became the witch finder generals <laughs> the leadership of it and uh, joined in uh, you know smearing people and uh, and well the rest is history now it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great tragedy i mean the whole this whole episode is it's a bit like a greek tragedy i've got to say you know the the real potential that was there and to see it destroyed listen if we'd have got jeremy in as uh, into 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 uh 10 downing street uh, uh, uh julian assange would now be uh, released and not only would he be out of prison he wouldn't be facing extradition either no uh, you know, that's, that's just one example of the of the difference that would have been brought about that's been, you know, that was prevented by was actively, you know, worked against, sabotaged by the by these people who were charged with fighting for the Labour Party, you know, delivering a Labour help, helping to deliver a Labour victory, and uh, oh, they, well. I mean they were like essentially fifth columnists for the Tory Party. Right? Well, we'll see what this investigation into the investigation that led to the report. Uncovers, shall we? I'm not holding yes. my breath. I don't know about you, Chris. Is there anything else you need to, you want to say while I've got you? No, thanks. I mean, and good luck and keep doing what you're doing, Gordon, because, I mean, we desperately need, uh, you know, alternative platforms like yours to we do. give the alternative narrative out there. I mean, and there's, there's, you know, there's yourself and there's, you know, platforms like the Canary and, uh, 
uh, you know, various other platforms like that, uh, you know, Renegade TV and stuff. But uh, it's really, really important that we do support these other platforms because we know that we don't get the truth out of the, uh, the mainstream. Uh, we get a very uh, one-sided, one-eyed view of the world. And, uh, you know, we've seen that throughout history, really. I mean, it's nothing new. Um, I remember the minor strike and the way in which uh, that was completely misrepresented and the way in which Arthur Scargill was entirely and completely yeah. humanized. But, uh, you know, this, this, I mean, this goes back, I mean, right, you know, back to, was in 1924, there's an obvious letters that the Daily Mail published, which was uh, fake letters, and there was some alleged uh, plot between the Labour leadership and uh, Russian um, revolutionaries to bring about revolution in this country. Frankly, we'd have benefited from a revolution in this, in this country, actually, had we had one. But, well, we uh, certainly would benefit from one right now. I think we can both bloody agree with that. Chris Williamson, yeah. thanks very much for, for your time, mate. I'll leave a link to your Twitter and everything down below. Go and check him out. And, and uh, I'll, you know, when, this, uh, when, when the Left Legal Fund is launched, let me know and I'll, I'll obviously try and promote it as much as I can. Thanks very much for all you do, Chris, and um, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Brilliant, thank you.